Okay, the, the subject of, uh, of this lecture is uh, uh, from monarchy uh, to democracy. This is ob obviously one of the main subjects that I cover in my, uh, in my book about uh, democracy, the God that failed, and whoever does not have that book yet. <laughs> uh, can, um, I talked about m monarchs already uh, in in the previous uh, two lectures um, about its the role of monarchs in feudal societies, uh, which we can refer to as basically pre-state um, societies. Um, and uh, then in the last lecture about uh, the position of monarchs as, uh, as heads of, of state and the transition from the feudal stage to the uh, monarchical state uh, state. Um, roughly speaking, historically, um, and uh, only talking about uh, Europe in this case, um, the period of uh, feudal monarchs uh, is roughly the period from 1100 to 1500 and then from 1500 uh, until the end of World War I, uh, that is uh, the period of uh, monarchical states, the later stages uh, constitutional monarchical states and in the earlier state uh, what we refer to typically as absolute uh, monarchies. Um, as I said, the discussion uh, during the last two lectures um, referred mostly to, um, to the development in Europe uh, and I will come back to uh, the European development, that is to Christian monarchies and the transition from Christian monarchs to democracy in a moment. But I want to say uh, a few things about uh, the institution of, uh, of kings and uh, monarchs in general, even outside of um, the European uh, uh, scenery. Um, in a way, monarchs are, so to speak, um, the more typical form of rulership, whether pre-state or state uh, rulers, than any other f than any other form. Uh, democracies uh, are a very rare event in uh, in human history, and. In a way, it is easy to explain why that is, um, because patriarchy um, is, so to speak, one of the most natural institutions uh, that you can imagine. Um, you have, of course, fathers as the heads of households, and by and large, um, the idea of, of kings was uh, modeled after uh, the structure that you find in households. Uh, kings were typically regarded as yeah, the head of extended families uh, or the head of clans or the head of uh, tribes um, or later on then of course as the, the head of uh, entire nations, but uh, along the lines uh, of, uh, of the idea uh, this is, so to speak, a natural development similar to what we see in, uh, in, each, in each family um, developing. All kings um, try to associate themselves with some sort of uh, religious um, or give themselves some sort of religious uh, dignity and in many places uh, on the globe uh, kings were considered to be uh, either gods or uh, 
incarnations of gods or descendants of gods or as people who acquired godlike status um, after their um, after their deaths um, and uh, kings in in all societies um, try to provide in a way two uh, two functions on the one hand the function as uh, as judge and priest um, that is so to speak as the intellectual uh, head uh, of uh, larger groups of uh, people uh, and on the other hand uh, the function as warrior and uh, protector um, of, uh, of their clans or tribes or whatever the group was uh, of which they were considered to be the head. Um, and and uh, uh, while it was sometimes the case that these two functions, uh, the priest-judge function and the warrior protection function were separated and occupied by different individuals, um, uh, there was always an attempt made uh, to combine to combine uh, the two, uh, make the protector and warrior also uh, at the same time um, the high priest. And of course, in combining these two uh, functions, um, you would achieve far greater power than. Uh, if these two functions were somehow exercised by different individuals controlling, um, controlling each other. Um, so frequently the king, um, actually outside of the West more typically the case, uh, the king was also considered to be uh, the head of, um, relig of the religious organization or the head of uh, the church that was the case in places like uh, Egypt or also in Japan uh, in in the Islamic world um, um, with the Hindus and also in the case of China the uniqueness of the West as I uh, mentioned in a previous uh, lectures the uniqueness of uh, the Western civilization was precisely um, the relative uh, strict separation of these two uh, functions by different individuals and different um, institutions. Um, this is not to say that that existed in the West throughout. Uh, it was certainly the case that uh, the religious uh, leader the Pope uh, tried to acquire also earthly powers um, and uh, vice versa that the the earthly ruler so to speak uh, tried to control um, the churches um, but certainly from about a thousand or so um, the separation between the two uh, roles worked for quite some time in Europe basically until um, the Protestant revolutions when the combination also in the West between church on the one hand and uh, state or earthly rulers on the other hand uh, became increasingly um, closer again. Um, this separation between uh, the uh, church leaders and uh, the earthly uh, worldly rulers uh, did not of course prevent that the various kings uh, claimed some sort of elevated uh, uh, status for themselves. I mentioned in the previous uh, lecture that uh, the kings of England for instance uh, try to trace back their own uh, claims to the land uh, to uh, Adam and Eve uh, 
um, and, and thereby present themselves, so to speak, as, uh, uh, as people whose position had been founded ultimately uh, by God and uh, that uh, all of their subjects were indeed nothing else but uh, yeah, uh, the offspring and the, the following the, te the tenants of, um, of them. Um, nonetheless, at least for the Christian world, even if kings uh, claimed that they had this special um, uh, historical dignity of having been installed by God directly or indirectly into their position, um, precisely because in Christianity um, kings are not considered to be God-like figures uh, and we have a, a transcendent uh, God, um, kings were always considered to be under the law like everyone, uh, like everyone else. Um, and because of this, um, in the West, the institution of uh, regicide, killing the king, um, was always considered to be quite legitimate, uh, not entirely undisputed, uh, but uh, for centuries, of course, considered to be something that was entirely all right uh, if the king would not do what he was supposed to do according to the universal uh, law laid down by, uh, by the transcendent uh, God. In addition, in, in Europe, the power of the king, uh, at least in some parts of Europe, um, was always uh, restricted by the fact that there existed uh, other noblemen who claimed to be uh, the sole and exclusive owner of their land. That is, not to have received their <coughs> land as some sort of grant from the king, but being maybe on a smaller scale, but nonetheless uh, an equally safe private property owner as the king was of whatever he claimed to be his. This is what we refer to as the elodial, far, uh, elodial form of, uh, of feudalism. Um, and um, in so far, at least for the feudal king, um, he, he was recognized as, uh, as a voluntarily acknowledged judge and military, uh, military leader. And as I explained in the previous lecture, it took quite some time for him um, to uh, uh, secure and gain the position uh, as, uh, uh, as a sovereign, uh, uh, stripping these elodial uh, feudal owners of their uh, uh, full and complete uh, property rights and establishing uh, himself as, the, uh, as a compulsory um, monopolist. Um, now, with the establishment of uh, kings as, as states, um, uh, we can almost from the very beginning uh, discover the seeds uh, of the destruction of dynastic monarchies uh, in, the following, in the following way. Uh, remember what I explained about the justification that was given for the existence of a state, the justification that Hobbes developed. There will be uh, war of all against all, and the only way that we can create peace uh, is by having one monopolist on top of uh, the social hierarchy uh, being the ultimate judge equipped with taxes. 
Now, interestingly, in this justification, you realize uh, that it doesn't really matter for the Hobbesian argument who this monopolist is. Um, it happened to be monarchs at the time because the institution of monarchy is, so to speak, a relatively natural institution. Just uh, people who have more wisdom and uh, riches accumulated and uh, command more authority uh, are looked, uh, looked up upon. Um, so the first governments, the first states happen to be monarchs. But the argument for the state that monarchs, of course, used in order to establish themselves as a state has no, makes no reference to it must be a king um, who, is this, um, uh, who is this monopolist. Uh, in principle, it can be anyone. It just must be a monopolist who does it. Um, because of this, for instance, um, the English kings were initially quite uh, unsympathetic towards the Hobbesian argument uh, because they realized that it did not contain a specific justification or legitimation for the institution of dynastic monarchs. And um, uh, Hobbes was even um, suspected to have some sort of uh, Republican uh, sympathies uh, and even uh, as being somebody who might have secret uh, sympathies for, um, for Cromwell. Um, whether that is uh, true or not, it, it is irrelevant, but what is, what is of importance is is the fact that this justification of the state, this rational justification of the state, uh, embodies the seeds of the destruction of the institution of a monarchical state. Um, now this transition from monarchical state to a different form of state, to democracy, again, took several hundred years, just as the establishment of states out of pre-state uh, orders took um, several hundred years. Um, and the transition was driven, not least, um, by the very intellectuals um, that played an important role in securing uh, the position of kings as states. Remember, states need legitimacy. Uh, they need support, uh, voluntary support in, in the public. And it was precisely intellectuals that were hired by the king uh, that uh, spread this uh, idea about the necessity of uh, a monopolist judge equipped with uh, taxing power. Um, but as intellectuals uh, happen to be, uh, they are always uh, unsatisfied with, uh, with their own position, even though the position of their somehow improved being now somewhat employed or uh, semi-employed by, uh, by kings, as soon as they had reached this position, uh, they began to spread some sort of egalitarian, um, egalitarian views. Um, and these egalitarian views um, uh, simply pointed out to the, for pointed to the fact that uh, isn't that somehow unjust uh, that there exist people who have uh, privileges? Uh, that the king uh, is uh, guided by a different type of law uh, than uh, the rest of mankind is. That there are princely laws and privileges uh, 
and then the laws and rules that apply to um, to uh, the rest of uh, of mankind. Um, so the egalitarian propaganda took the form of an attack against um, privilege. Uh, how can privilege be squared with the idea that was a Christian idea that we are all created uh, equally by the same creator and, uh, and so forth. And uh, the alleged solution uh, proposed um, uh, to this uh, seeming injustice um, was uh, to say that there should be open entry uh, into the position of government. Why should it be the king? After all, only a state was necessary in order to create uh, law and order, and other people uh, could do that just as well as some sort of uh, hereditary, um, uh, hereditary king could do it. There were some, some people early on who recognized that the problem with the state king was in fact that the state king uh, represented a monopoly and that what was necessary as a solution was in a way to get rid of this monopoly power. Again, to have competing jurisdictions and so forth. But the overwhelming majority uh, took the line that uh, in order to abolish privileges, all we have to do is open up uh, entry into the government uh, to everyone. And they called this, of course, equality before the law. Um, now, let me point out from the outset that uh, there is, of course, an error involved in this. Um, by opening entry into the government agency to everyone instead of restricting it just to the members of some, um, some specific uh, family, you do not uh, abolish privileges. Um, what you do instead achieve is you substitute now uh, functional privileges for personal privileges. The king had a personal privilege and his successors a personal privilege. Um, but if you open entry to the position of uh, the government leader to everyone, uh, you still have a functional privilege. Everyone can now acquire this privileged position but there still exist privileged positions. Um, in legal terms, we can say, uh, instead of having a higher princely law and a lower law applying to the common man, we have now created, so to speak, public law, um, that is the law that regulates the behavior of those who are in charge of the state, and private law that applies to the rest of mankind. Um, but public law is, again, superior over private law in the same way as princely law was, so to speak, uh, superior over the law applying to, uh, to common, uh, common folks. Uh, public law beats. Uh, private law. And that, the, that there are privileges in effect, you can simply see by the fact that as a public official, uh, you could do things that as a private individual you were not allowed to do. This is of course true up to this day. As a public official, you can of course take the property of others. Uh, as a private citizen, this would be considered to be a crime. 
as a public official, you can enslave people. You can draft them into the army and military and so forth. If you were just a plain private individual, then that same task would be considered to be uh, an outrage and uh, would be a punishable offense. So privileges do not disappear um, by opening entry to government uh, to everyone. Uh, and, and not everyone is equal before the law either. Um, because there exist two types of law. If you are a public official, a different law applies to you and protects you than if you are a private individual, then you are only protected by, uh, by a subordinate form of law that is um, private, private law. Um, if we look at the change from uh, monarchy to democracy described as a system where entry into the government is available to um, everyone from a purely economic point of view, what happens in, uh, in this case is that we substitute a person uh, for a person who considers the entire territory over which he exercises monopolistic control, uh, that we substitute for somebody who considers the, his realm as his private property that he can pass on uh, to his uh, offspring, um, that we substitute for a person such as this, uh, a temporary caretaker um, who is in charge for a certain period of time uh, of, the same, uh, of the same territory. Um, but this being the owner of a territory uh, or being a temporary caretaker of a territory makes from an economic point of view a fundamental difference. Um, let me just illustrate that by using a very elementary example. Um, uh, I can give you a house and say you are the owner of the house. You can sell this house if you want. Uh, you can pass it on to future generations. Um, if you want, um, you can sell part of it. Uh, you have the right to collect rent from it and so forth. Uh, and on the other hand, I give you a house and say, you are not the owner of the house. You cannot sell it. Uh, you cannot determine who will be the successor. Um, can also not sell part of it, uh, but you can use it to your own advantage for a certain period of time. That is, the rent that you can get out of this house, you are free to do with this rental income whatever you want. Um, now, ask yourself whether or not these two people will treat the house in the same way or differently? And the answer is obvious. There will be a fundamental difference in the way that the house will be treated by these two individuals. Um, the incentive for the owner is, yes, of course, I try to get as high a rental income as possible out of the house, but at the same time, I always take into consideration what happens to the value of the capital stock of which I am the owner. Um, after all, I can sell the house. After all, I can pass the house on to future generations. And it is possible, for instance, to increase your rental income from your house uh, in such a way that the value uh, 
of the capital stock drops uh, or falls more than my increase in rental income that I, um, that I get. An owner would try to prevent something like this from happening. Um, and if he doesn't do this, then he will be punished in so far as he will see that the value of his property will fall in the property market. Um, a caretaker's incentives are entirely different. Um, a caretaker only owns the rental income. He does not own the capital stock. So what is his incentive? His incentive is to maximize my rental income regardless of what the repercussions are uh, with respect to the value of the capital stock. Um, let's say I put, uh, instead of one or two families in my house and collect rent from two families, I can also put uh, uh, a thousand guest workers into my house uh, and have one bed over the other, um, and th thereby I will definitely increase my uh, rental income, uh, but it is also easy to see what the price of this type of uh, usage will be. That is, uh, uh, there will be a deterioration of the property taking place very quickly the toilets will be plugged immediately, the, carpet will be, the carpets will be dirtied, uh, there will be graffiti on the walls and all the rest of it, and people come home drunk and smash the walls and who knows what. Um, again, if you know, I will be in charge of this house for four weeks. Um, and the losses, so to speak, in terms of the capital value are not my losses because I don't own the thing in the first place. Uh, your incentive will be to maximize my current income that can be used, ca can be achieved by using this capital even, uh, at, uh, even if it is a case that at the end of these four years, so to speak, the capital stock has been run to the ground and has completely been uh, has has been depleted. Um, now, on a large scale, so to speak, um, this is a difference between uh, democratic caretakers of countries and uh, kings as uh, caretakers uh, as uh, owners. Uh, of countries. Democratic caretakers incentive is uh, I have to loot the country as fast as possible because if I don't loot it as fast as possible then I will no longer be in power. I can make many many friends if I just impose tremendous amount of taxes right now. Um, and what happens after I'm out of power, who cares? Um, whereas kings, at least by and large, had of course an interest in preserving the value of their uh, dynastic property and pass on uh, uh, a valuable piece of property um, uh, to future generations. Now I'm not saying that every king will, so to speak, automatically be equally um, <coughs> good in terms of preserving uh, his capital values, nor do I say that every single democratic caretaker will precisely follow the scenario that I developed. But what I'm saying is the incentive structure is so different that we can expect that by and large, on the average, kings will have, so to speak, a longer planning horizon and a greater interest in the preservation of the capital stock. And democratic rulers, by and large, have a far smaller interest in the preservation of the capital stock and a far greater interest in the current consumption uh, 
of, uh, of uh, resources that you can press out of the existing uh, capital stock. Um, so the exploitation of a king is long-run exploitation, foresighted exploitation, calculated exploitation. The exploitation of a democratic caretaker is short-run uh, exploitation, non-calculating um, exploitation, and so forth. Let me just illustrate this by looking just at three, uh, at three dimensions here. Um, the subject of taxation. Um, for a king, of course, he wants to tax. There's no question. If everybody is tempted to do this. If you have the right to tax, of course, you like to tax. Um, but what he must keep in, uh, into pers what he will bring into perspective is, if I tax too much right now, uh, productivity of the population might go down in the long run and I will be in the long run in power also. Um, so he will more likely engage in moderate amount of taxation, always keeping in mind the disincentive to productive people that taxation implies. Compare this with a caretaker who is just in charge for a certain period of time. Uh, again, for him, the fact that in the long run uh, productivity will decline if he currently engages in massive amount of uh, taxation is a far lesser concern than it would be for a king because after all, in the f more distant future, he will likely not be in power. He is far more present oriented in, in this regard and discounts the fact that high taxation means a reduction in productivity on the part of the subject population to a greater extent than a king would do. Um, look at the subject of uh, of debt, of state debt. Um, now, yeah, a king uh, is of course also inclined to incur debt, and they all did, um, especially for war finance and so forth. Um, uh, but uh, kings uh, typically, in order to get credit uh, had to pledge certain things as securities. Um, and, um, uh, and in addition, though that was somewhat disputed, um, there was always the possibility that the future generations were held responsible for the debt incurred by their own father or mother. Um, that was not in all cases carried through, but it was hanging as a, uh, uh, as a Damocles sword above the head of a king that uh, maybe the next generation uh, is expected to pay, off my, uh, to pay off my debt. And again, he knows, of course, if his debt load is, is too high, uh, this again has long-run negative repercussions on savings rates and so forth and he tries to avoid uh, these long-run consequences uh, to a certain extent at least. And now consider a public uh, caretaker and his attitude toward government debt. Um, first of all, uh, nobody of these people ever expects that any of them will be held personally responsible for the debt to be repaid. Um, look, Ronald Reagan, uh, who indebted the United States more so than anybody before him, and now our beloved uh, <coughs> Bush warrior, uh, who again indebts this country to a tremendous amount, um, they do not uh, poor, uh, poor Reagan is not in, in debtor's prison. Uh, 
uh, nor will Bush have to fear that he will be uh, jailed if he doesn't repay the debt. Uh, they just uh, take up an, as much debt as they can and say some future suckers will have to pay for, for this. <laughs> um, in addition, of course, they do not give any securities for it. Um, that is, uh, whereas uh, uh, so major lenders to kings insisted, of course, but you see, if you don't repay, I get this castle or that castle or this little piece of land or that piece of land from you. There are no pledges of any securities whatsoever. Um, if, uh, if the government defaults on their debt, uh, none of you are entitled to take over whatever uh, the Grand Canyon or some place, uh, some place like this. So no security uh, whatsoever. And again, you can, of course, imagine uh, that the tendency of, uh, of democratic governments to run up uh, debts uh, is far more pronounced than it would be um, under, um, under monarchical rule. The same applies to inflation. Um, yes, of course, kings loved inflation also coin clipping and so forth. It enriches you. Uh, but uh, again, there are two concerns that you have. On the one hand, by inflating, you increase your current income. On the other hand, you will get, of course, in future taxes, inflated money back. Um, for people who have a very short run perspective, um, it is just what counts far more is the per current advantage that you have in terms of inflating that just you can print the money and then buy yourself a Mercedes and a BMW or whatever you want. Uh, and then you realize, of course, how many friends you have that you were not even aware who also just realize that, man, these guys have the magic wand. They can just create wealth just by printing up paper money, yes, of course you get inflated paper money in the form of future taxes back too. But again, in the future you will not be there. You will not be the recipient of that inflated money that comes back in the form of taxes. So your attitude towards inflation uh, is uh, more generous, so to speak. You like inflation uh, more. Uh, again, for all of these uh, uh, predictions that I make, there exists, of course, ample uh, empirical evidence that this is uh, indeed the case. Let me just emphasize, for instance, that uh, while kings tried uh, uh, several times to substitute paper monies uh, for uh, commodity monies such as gold and silver, uh, all of these attempts were relatively short-lived attempts. Um, and they had to go back to, uh, to a gold or silver standard. Whereas it is typical for the democratic world, which begins essentially after World War I, um, that during this period, for the first time in all of mankind, it happens that commodity monies disappear entirely on a worldwide scale and wherever you go and walk, all you have is paper money and of course paper money inflation on a scale that was unheard of in, uh, in, previous, uh, in previous centuries. Um, there's also a difference, different attitude among kings as compared to democratic caretakers when it comes to the redistribution of income. Uh, both can take other people's property. But the king, if he takes the property of private individuals, runs an ideological danger. That is, uh, 
he himself, vis-à-vis -vis other kings, considers himself also to be a private property owner. He does not want to undermine the legitimacy of private property because if he does, then of course, his competitors, King George or King Henry or whatever, King Fritz, they might then be interested also in taking his property. Um, so he is very much interested in maintaining uh, the leg legitimacy of, pro of the institution of private property as such. So his forms of redistribution uh, are rarely redistributions, uh, so to speak, from, from the rich to groups of poor, but the redistribution activities through which he tries to uh, achieve popularity and so forth are typically privileges, benefits that he gives to particular individuals and mostly to individuals uh, who have achieved something. Um, just uh, take the Habsburgs as an example. Um, they ennobled people who were uh, enemies of monarchy, say they usually ennobled other big ruffians like they were ruffians. But that is not really true, or in most of the cases at least it is not true. They en ennobled in most cases indeed people who had achieved something. Um, that's why the family of Ludwig von Mises uh, was ennobled, uh, despite the fact, for instance, that he was Jewish. Um, uh, so they had also relatively little uh, racial, uh, racial hatreds because all the noble houses were somehow interconnected. Um, and there was sort of a far more international orientation among the kings than about democratic caretakers who tend to be nationalistic jerks. <laughs> um, um, the redistribution of uh, under democratic conditions is different. Um, it's like you have to be re-elected all the time and you have to be re-elected by masses. Um, and the masses always consist of have-nots. There exist always more have-nots than haves in every dimension of having that is worth having. Um, that is, in terms of money, in terms of beauty, in terms of smarts, whatever it is, there always exist more dummies than smarts, there always exist more poor than rich, and so forth. Um, so what the strategy under democratic systems is, of course, the redistribution of income. First of all, you don't have to legitimize this anymore because after all, uh, you are now operating no longer as somebody who defends the principle of private property. You are in favor of public property and consider public property to be uh, superior, more important <coughs> than private property. So taking private property is no ideological problem for for you, and then of course you distribute it not to individuals, but you distribute it to masses, and by and large uh, to the masses of uh, of have-nots. That is the less capable people in all dimensions of uh, um, of capability. Um, then let me come to the argument that is frequently brought up in favor of um, democracy, that is, uh, shouldn't we as free marketeers be in favor of free entry? Um, after all, this is what we learn in economics. Uh, monopoly is bad um, from the point of view of consumers because there is no longer free entry into every line of production. And if there is no longer free entry into every line of production, then the incentive of a producer to produce at the lowest possible cost uh, 
uh, is no longer in existence. Imagine this. Uh, if there exists free entry in a free market, uh, everybody can become a car manufacturer, for instance. Then if I produce a car at cost that are higher than the minimum cost of producing this car, I basically extend an invitation to somebody else to go into competition against me, produce the same product at minimum cost, lower cost than my cost, and then be able, of course, to charge a lower price for the product and thereby drive me out of the market. On the other hand, if we have restrictions to free entry, then this pressure to produce at the lowest possible cost does no longer exist. This is, so to speak, the case that we make normally for why we are in favor of competition, meaning free entry into every line of production, and why we are against monopoly, meaning uh, entrance into certain lines of production is either prohibited or obstacles are placed in the way of free entry and so forth. So the argument of some uh, advocates of democracy goes then, yeah, isn't the same thing true here? Um, the king, uh, that is restricted entry. Uh, and democracy, all of a sudden, entry is open. And isn't this a big advantage of democracy over monarchy? Now, the problem with this argument is this. The argument against monopoly and in favor of competition that I presented before only holds insofar as we are considering the production of goods. Um, the argument, however, does not hold if we consider the production of bads. Um, and this is precisely what governments do. After all, those people who are taxed do not pay a price for being taxed. That is to say, they are not considering being taxed to be a good. Uh, those people who are, through legislative action, uh, stripped of their property or robbed of part of their property, do not consider that to be a good that happens to them. They consider that to be a bad. Those people who see that their purchase, the purchasing power of their money goes down as a result of paper money printing, do not consider this the production of goods. They do consider that as a production of something bad. Now, do we want to have competition in the area of the production of bads? And the answer should be obvious. No. In the production of bads, we want to have uh, at least a, a, as little competition as there can possibly be. We do not want to have competition who would be the most efficient uh, commandant of a gas chamber. We would not want to have competition who would be the best whipper of slaves. Um, there we would be perfectly happy if that uh, s uh, slave whipping or gas chamber commandante uh, occup occupation would be very restricted and we would be quite happy if very incompetent people uh, <laughs> exercise this power rather than looking for people who are particularly good at this. Um, now, continuing this argument, um, you might say uh, kings can, of course, because they get into their position by accident of birth, can, of course, be evil guys. No question about it. But uh, if they are <laughs> evil guys and uh, uh, pose a danger that through their activity the possession of their dynasty, after all they are head of a family, uh, is threatened, then what typically happens is of course 
that one of their close relatives uh, will be designated um, to make short shrift with this guy and uh, chop off his head. Um, that is, we have a way of getting rid of these people and don't even have to worry too much about uh, the general public taking care of this problem. It is within the family of those weird kings themselves where they have the greatest incentive either to surround these weirdos with advisors who curtail their evil desires or if this doesn't work then have somebody hired out of their own family to kill this guy off. Um, on the other hand, if you come into the position by accident, uh, it is also possible that these people can be nice and decent people. Uh, like nice uncles, so to speak. Um, they do not have to worry about being re-elected and so forth. Um, they have been by and large trained for a long time uh, to be the future king or queen and take care of the country. And believe me, I have met some uh, members of royal houses. Uh, the upbringing of those people on the average tends to be an upbringing that most people would not like to suffer. Um, that is to say, there is far more demanded of them in terms of decent good behavior and so forth than of the normal run-of-the-mill type uh, people. Uh, I'm glad that I'm not uh, one, of, uh, one of the offsprings of, uh, uh, of a royal house. There is in most of these places relatively little fun in your life. Um, in those monarchical families that have been deposed, they have become, of course, frequently playboys. That's true, because there is, of course, no preparation any for anything anymore. Uh, they just uh, have affairs and gamble and do this and that. But in those places where there is still the expectation that they will get into the position, I tell you, there is discipline that you have never seen in your own house before. Um, on the other hand, look at uh, democratic rulers, how they get to power. They have to be elected. Um, and there it should be perfectly clear that under this condition, that is with free entry, everyone can become president, senator, whatsoever. And these people are in the business of doing bad things, being capable of doing bad things. We have, so to speak, a competition. Who is the smartest bad guy? <laughs> um, who is the most demagogic, uh, best demagogic talent? Who is a magnificent briber, liar, cheater, and all the rest of it? Under democratic conditions, especially on the central level, it is almost impossible that a decent person will ever be elected to a high rank. This might not be the case in a small village. In a small village, there are still some sort of social constraints. There's the biggest, smoothest liar and so forth might not win an election in a village of 100 people where everybody knows what kind of jerk he is. Um, but go to higher level, state level, federal level, and so forth, it is almost assured uh, that a person who, out of conviction, doesn't lie, who says, we should, of course, not rip off the poor, the rich in order to give to the poor, but we should protect private property rights under all circumstances. A person like this uh, has a chance to be elected as, it uh, uh, was, was as likely to be elected as that, that it will snow uh, in the summer in Las Vegas. Um, 
you had a question, yeah. Yeah, do you think part of the line comes from the simple scale, like on the large scale that you're, you're more of a liar because you're convincing people uh, yes. about things that you couldn't comment? Yes, it, 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 the, the, sc the scale plays a tremendous role in it. Um, because of this, by the way, you know, in, hist in, in history of political thought, you find practically no one who advocated democracy. Uh, democracy was always considered to be a contemptible political system. The only few who advocated it, let's say like Rousseau or so, only considered to be democracy uh, possible in small places. Um, where it is precisely social control, n knowing what type of people these people are, and where it is far more difficult to advocate, so to speak, stealing, robbing, taxing to the hilt people that live next door to you, of whom you know that they acquired their property in perfectly reasonable way and that they were that they deserve to own what they own and it was their own ambition and energy that were responsible to have this nicer house. Uh, and then meeting him on the street and saying, you know, I know that you are a perfectly honest man and never betrayed anybody, but nonetheless I vote in favor of your house should be taken away. That's difficult to do. Yeah, but if you have these large scales, you, you don't know whose property you rip off. You don't, never meet these people. It's completely anonymous and of course that as more anonymous it is, uh, the lower are the inhibitions that you have against ag engaging in these type of immoral activities, activities that on a small scale you would, you would not want to look in the mirror yourself and see yourself for what you have advocated. But on a big scale, no problem whatsoever. Yeah. In quest for, a, for an a priori to apply to like the spread or this, this growth in support of, of democracy, can we say that it kind of stems to the disability of labor from the standpoint that basically people see these redistributions and, you know, I guess, well, from the same point that we see these artificial booms, you know, given what you had mentioned about, you know, control of the, the money supply and whatnot, that it's kind of, it, it all goes back to this sort of, this human tendency to have a you know disability of labor, as, as Rothbard would say. I'm not quite sure if I uh, understand. No, I think it. What it does is more what I describe in my book. It is. Uh, it encourages uh, high time preference. Uh, you see, you can uh, without. Uh, without having to delay your own gratifications, you can just simply grab the things of other people. Um, you find a quick fix for everything, uh, rather than working out a solid solution to a problem. So I'm not quite sure if I understand. You might want to address that question afterwards again in, uh, in private. Um, let me just make a few uh, a few more remarks. There is also far more resistance against raising taxes if you have monarchs in place. Because uh, everybody sees this is a monarch, I cannot be the monarch, uh, I'm just a regular, uh, regular guy, um, and why should he tax me? Um, so there will be a resistance against being taxed because you realize you will never benefit from this sort of stuff. Um, on the other hand, as soon as everybody has a chance to become president, senator, whatever it is, you do not like if you are taxed as long as you are, so to speak, outside of government, but there is a consolation price. The consolation price is maybe I'm at one point, I'm at the other end of all of this, and that makes me put up with the taxation uh, more easily than I otherwise would. Uh, lastly, another important argument is this. Again, recall, 
kings that overdo it, uh, they quickly lose their heads. Um, Democrats, even if they are far more evil than kings ever would be, because you think, now yeah, maybe in four years we can get rid of this SOB, will rarely be killed. Uh, and imagine how nice it would be if this institution of regicide would also be expanded to uh, democraticide or something of that uh, nature. Um, let me just um, end on some offside remarks. Um, the first, the first one has something to do with the fact that, uh, or explains somehow how I developed these ideas about monarchy. The person who made me interested in the subject in the first place was uh, Eric von Kühnelt Ledin, with whom I was somewhat friends. He was, of course, far older than I am. Um, before that, I like like most people, I always thought monarchy. What, what an idiotic thing to say! How can you even how can you even talk about this subject? So he convinced me that that was something worthwhile thinking about. I think he did not have nearly as convincing arguments as I developed, and he. <laughs> I, I, I'm not boasting because he himself admitted that. Um, I mean, he has written, before he died, he wrote uh, still a few articles, and in every one he quotes me and says that I have, of course, developed this stuff far further than he ever thought possible. Um, so it is not that I just uh, uh, boast about this. Um, the idea that uh, I stumbled across first, uh, from which I then developed this was uh, having observed um, that in the former Soviet Union, uh, in contrast to most places on Earth, in the last few decades, life expectancies fell. Um, and having traveled extensively in the East Bloc because my parents came from East Germany, were expropriated there, and I had relatives there and visited these places. Um, I always noticed also the bad, the bad health conditions of these people, despite the fact that they had, of course, free health care. Uh, they had, they had, everything was free, except uh, nothing was ever available of these allegedly free things. Um, and I asked myself what could explain this, that uh, uh, life expectancy falls everywhere else. It seems to be going up. And another striking observation was uh, the massive amount of people that the Soviet Union killed and worked to death, even during peacetime. And uh, then it came upon me, uh, there's, there's actually a very simple explanation for this. And the explanation is simply this. There exist two types of slavery. There exists the old run-of-the-mill type slavery that we are familiar with in the United States. You Americans are familiar with that and guilty for it. I, of course, not. <laughs> um, Germans have done other things, but not that. Yeah. Um, so where well, you have private ownership in slaves. Um, and in the Soviet Union, and in these East Bloc countries, you also had a form of slavery. Because slavery is characterized by two marks. On the one hand, uh, you cannot run away. If you run away, they catch you, kill you, and whatever. And the second characteristic mark is they can assign you to work. Now, this they could do in the Soviet Union. You could not run away. They would shoot you dead if you tried to do this. And of course, you could not hang around. Uh, if you were just hanging around, they would take you and put you, put you to work at some place. Um, but the slaves in the Soviet Union were, of course, not privately owned slaves. 
that is Lenin and Stalin, Gorbachev and whatever, they did not, uh, could not sell these people in the, in the slave market and pocket the money or rent them out for a few hours uh, and, and then finance their beers from the rental money that they, that they got and so forth. No, they were just uh, public owners, public caretakers of these slaves. Um, they could exploit them, so to speak, to the hilt, uh, but they did not own the capital in them. That is, they did not own the person. <coughs> and once you realize this, then it is perfectly clear that a private slave owner who can sell the slave in the slave market, who can rent it out, who can pass it on to his son, will of course by and large treat his slave far more humanely than somebody who is a public slave owner. Um, because the private slave owner of course sees if he mistreats the slave, uh, the value of the slave will fall. What private slave owner would just for the joy of it kill the slave? Um, the answer is that is a very rare event. Just as like a farmer doesn't kill his horses and cows just for the fun of it. Uh, after all, they represent his capital goods. But in the Soviet Union, in those places where you had public slavery, this is precisely what happened. People did not take care of their slaves. Life expectancy fell. If these slaves dropped like the flies, no problem. You just got new supply just around the corner. Um, so if you would have the choice, so to speak, you must be a slave. You can't be a free man. What would be your choice? Would you want to be a privately owned slave or would you want to be a gulag slave? And I think the answer is perfectly clear. I rather want to be a privately owned slave than a gulag slave. And when it comes to democracy and monarchy, the thing is basically the same. Uh, if you cannot be a free man, if you cannot have uh, a natural order that respects private property, but you have to be ripped off by somebody. Would you rather want to be ripped off by some dynasty of kings or by some randomly elected um, caretakers? And I think the answer to this question is also relatively clear. Um, as the last thing I want to do is, again, give you an example that I always also give to my students and uh, based on uh, their reaction, always find very, um, very inst instructive, um, explaining, so to speak, the effects of democracy. You know that during the 19th century, uh, the right to vote was extremely restricted. Uh, in many countries, it didn't exist at all early on in the 19th century. And then it was gradually expanded successively. First, of course, people only thought about male franchise. Females were considered to be just appendixes of men. Uh, voting just like their husband does. Unfortunately, they don't do that anymore either. Um, you mean not allow the voter or vote like their husband? Vote like their husband. Oh. And, of, and, and, um, and the, interestingly, the, the country, for instance, that introduced the male franchise first, gave almost full male franchise, uh, happened to be the country that gave the right to vote to women last, that was Switzerland. And uh, since that time, Switzerland is also in very iffy conditions. You know? I mean, well, they were already in, in, in great danger before, but the danger has dramatically uh, 
uh, increased since that time. Um, but as you realize, of course, I, I have nothing against women at all. I, I'm, a, I'm a lover of women. And I'm, just in, I'm just in favor of nobody should have the right to vote. But in any case, so in the, in the 19th in the 19th century, so the gradually the franchise was expanded, and parallel to the expansion of the franchise, the classical liberal movement died out, and, uh, and social democratic and socialist parties uh, came to power, and even those parties who called themselves liberal are no longer liberal in the previous classical sense. They have become uh, social, social liberal parties. And in order to illustrate this tendency to make that, uh, to make people understand this as almost a necessary consequence of expanding the franchise, um, I always use two examples. The first example is, imagine we have a world democracy. One man, one woman, one vote on a worldwide scale. Um, so what will the result of that be? There will be an Indian-Chinese coalition government simply by virtue of numbers. Um, what will this Indian-Chinese coalition government do in order to be re-elected the next, in the next round? They will, of course, initiate a massive redistribution, in, uh, income and wealth redistribution program from the United States and Western Europe to, uh, to, those, uh, to those regions. Does anybody have the slightest doubt that that will be the result? I think I have not found any student in my classes who ever had the slightest doubt that that is what is going to happen. And then you point out, look, what do you think happened when they expanded the franchise in your own country? And then they begin to realize, oh, that probably exactly the same thing happened there too. Maybe not as drastically because the population was more homogeneous. Uh, the difference between income levels were not as pronounced as they are now between India and the United States or places like this. But of course the same thing has happened there. And the second example is, uh, in the 19th century, the age when people could vote was relatively high. And by and large, they had also, of course, property restrictions. Um, but look just at the age. So there were many places like Italy or so forth, while the age was 29 years, in a country with a life expectancy of 45. <laughs> so only old men uh, could vote at that place. That would be nowadays like uh, only people above 75 would be allowed to, uh, to vote. And then it was, of course, gradually reduced to currently 18. Now, we have to admit that 18 is, of course, a completely arbitrary date. Um, uh, why not 12? <laughs> um, in many places of the world, people can write with 12. In the United States, that is not always clear, but uh, <laughs> many, many places it is known of people that they are able to write. Um, so why not, why not 12? Um, now, what would then happen? I would not predict that a 12-year-old would then be elected to be president or something like this. Uh, but what you can predict is, of course, that every political party would on their platform have something about the legitimate concerns uh, of the, and rights of the children. Um, just as we are nowadays greatly concerned about the elderly, that we treat them right because we know they have the most time on their hands and tend to go and schlep out to these elections, whereas other people sometimes have to work, can't go. Um, so we would be greatly concerned about their well-being and what would these platforms then likely contain. Uh, okay, uh, at least one visit to Toys R Us per month, uh, <laughs> free videos from Blockbuster, as many as you want, uh, at least one square meal at uh, McDonald's or Burger King per day, uh, and a big gulp for every kid at all times. 
Okay, with this I end my lecture. Thank you. I'll take a few questions. Yeah. Um, help me understand why what the framers thought they were putting in place a republic. Uh, why that's such a rotten idea and why it can't happen. Now, yeah, in a way, if you, yeah, let me begin this way. All the framers uh, were anti-democrats. There was nobody who was in favor of democracy. Democracy uh, had a connotation of being, so to speak, a moderate form of communism. Um, I think the most democratic one was Jefferson. I do not see Jefferson quite as positive as people in the United States see Jefferson because of that. Uh, I also do not see Andrew Jackson quite as positive as many Americans, especially libertarian Americans do, because I think Jeff the Jackson is the next big step forward towards, uh, towards democracy. Um, but if you accept the idea of, of a republic, um, you have basically accepted the idea that everyone can be president, senator, prime minister, and so forth. And if you have accepted that idea, then it is very difficult somehow to say, uh, yeah, but why should not everybody also have some say about who that should be? Um, so you ha the dam has already been broken, and once the dam is broken, then I think it is almost irresistible that you will also have to accept the democratic principles, even though they try to make a distinction between a republic and, and democracy. But you, you admit, in a way, uh, the, the principle that, that everyone is equal and can get into the position and this leads you then to one man, one vote, almost, uh, almost inescapably, I think. Well, our experience would absolutely show that limited government does not work. You cannot. Yeah, no, of course, I, as, I, as I explained, you know, once you accept the idea of uh, there is a monopoly judge and the monopoly judge has a right to tax, then, then the prediction is the monopoly judge will just pass laws that are in his own favor and he will always try to increase uh, taxes and in fact work less and less. Uh, that follows simply from, from, the, uh, from the definition of, uh, of what a state is. One, one other little remark which I learned from my friend uh, Kühnert Ledin. Uh, which in some circles also works well as an anti-democratic uh, argument. In other circles, it is just simply laughed off. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, let, let me try it. Um, so he said, uh, you know, who are the most, two most important figures in, in for Western civilization? Uh, according to him, we would tend to agree, it is Jesus and Socrates. Um, and then the next question was, who killed Jesus and who killed Socrates? And the answer is, democracy killed Jesus and democracy killed Socrates. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In the Soviet Union, it seems to me that only the most severely enslaved were in the gulag. Yes, of course, that was. Um, but that difference is somehow as a difference between a house slave and a field slave when, it, when you look at private slaves, right? Not all slaves were, even under that system, equally, <laughs> equally well treated. Yeah. You would prefer to be a house slave rather than somebody who has to just push the horses and cows around and whatever, pick cotton and who knows what. So those people who worked in regular enterprises in the Soviet Union were of course, the, so to speak, the house slaves. And those who were in the gulag uh, 
those uh, those were the field slaves. Even an American slave. You remember, you're gone with the wind when he says, "But Miss Scarlett, we house servants." <laughs> yeah. Right. I think that's what uh, that's what the uh, run of the mill Soviets uh, said also when they when they uh, when they met the Gulag <laughs> when they met the Gulag people. Yeah. yeah. Just you first. In my classroom mm -hmm. of former Soviets, when I would use this example about them being public slaves, uh, and then they say, "Oh, we're, we weren't." Some of them would say we weren't. Then they would get into an argument among themselves about whether they were or not. Because they'd say, well, I can work any place I want. And others would say, well, no, you, you know, maybe you did, but you had special privilege. And others did not. So that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah but by, and, by and large, you did not, you, you could not freely choose your, uh, not even your place of residence in these, uh, in these places. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, people in the East Bloc, of course, they prefer to move to the capital cities because the capital cities were always somewhat better supplied with consumer goods because you had di foreign diplomats living there and tourists going there, so they wanted to make the stores look a little bit nicer. And there was huge numbers of applications to move whatever to Berlin or to Prague or to Bratislava or to Belgrade or whatever the capitals were. Um, and, uh, and most of these countries had internal passports. So you, you could not just move wherever you wanted. You had to, sp sp you lived in whatever, in, uh, in uh, Minsk or Irkutsk or whatever it was, and you, you stayed there. That was it. Unless they, unless they just decided that uh, uh, now they need somebody here, and then they transported you to a different place. Yeah. I wonder if you would just say a word about another argument you raise against democracy. I think in a theory of socialism and capitalism where you say that democracy can't represent some kind of absolute moral imperative because the person who's committed to the value of democracy would have to admit that if the majority votes to transform the democracy into a monarchy or some sort of totalitarian regime, that that itself would be fully consistent with the democratic idea. Right, right. I don't have to say anything <laughs> uh, besides that you are absolutely right. Yeah. Last question. Uh, okay, given, the, given a democratic system, do you think uh, the effect of term limits on office holders raises or lowers their time preference? So. I, I, I think it uh, raises the time preference. Okay, thank you so much.